Hello and welcome to the Createx stage on day three of Virtual COGX. It's been a marathon effort to make sure that everyone's Wi-Fi is working, we're all in the right place, and it is such a good panel that I'm about to introduce here. We're talking about all the web is a stage, the digital future of performing arts, and it is my pleasure to introduce Susan Boster. Susan Boster is a managing director of Boster Group, and she is going to introduce the rest of the panel. So enjoy it. And uh, we look forward to hearing your questions. There will be a Q&A straight after the event as well. And there are some fantastic artists and performers who work in various different, you know, we've got um, Kwame, uh, Kwame Kwe Amar, Amar who uh, works, well, he's an amazing actor. I've seen him on, um, on my television screen and in the theatre for so long now. Um, Adrian Lester and Lalita Chakrabarti. So we're just waiting for Susan Boster to come on. I know that she's had a couple of Wi-Fi issues actually, but that's just the reality of what it looks like. Ah, oh, fantastic, you're here. Yay. I'm so pleased to see Thank you. you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so everybody welcome and thank you for for sitting through the uh the technological issues all of us at flood street were racing around but we're here and you're here which is even more important so welcome and th big thank you to the team at cogex i remember hearing charlie in the opening with tab saying when i told my mother we were going to go virtual my mother thought i was crazy and i want to say charlie and tabs, you've done it. Congratulations, Muzzle Muzzletop. This is fantastic, um, and thank you for putting together this amazing, exceptional um, virtual festival. Before we get to the talent, I wanted to just quickly tell you uh, about Foster Group. Uh, we were founded actually 20 years ago, and we specialize in collaboration and partnerships between corporations, cultural institutions, and social impact foundations. Um, the theater industry is a cornerstone of the UK's international cultural reputation and brings in well over five billion pounds to our economy. But the intangible values it promotes, like creativity and shared experience between performers and audience, are even more important. In isolation, millions of people have tuned in to broadcasts from theaters and plays at digital festivals, not to mention how Netflix subscriptions have skyrocketed. And I wanna add one more bit, and I read it out of Sam Mendy's article, um, one of, well, the first artistic director of the Donmar Warehouse, where I proudly serve on the board. And he quoted in his article uh, in the um, FT Magazine over the weekend that in 2018 alone, 34 million people attended theater shows in the UK, approximately the same number that attended Premier League and English Football League matches during the same period. Um, moving over, the performing arts are sitting at a crossroads and digital capture and distribution are a short term solution to reach people at home. But without a timeline for when our venues can reopen and film crews start rolling, what digital solutions can truly invigorate the performing arts? As we've seen over the course of the festival, there've been phenomenal advancements in VR, AI, and computer-generated imagery. Maybe you've heard of Lil Miquela, the CGI avatar, who's an Instagram influencer, musical artist, and has now been signed to an acting agency. How can tech and theater take these technologies and work together um, to push their applications further? So joining me to dig into these questions are three incredible creatives who we're so lucky to have, all acknowledged leaders in the world of theater and film as a trustee of the Donmar Warehouse, again, where our artistic director, Mike Longhurst, quickly pulled together a revival of his lauded production of Midnight Your Time for broadcast via YouTube. I'm excited to hear thoughts on how new technologies can be used to augment our live performances. So let me start by introducing you to each of our panelists. Kwame Kweama is the artistic director of The Young Vic and also an award-winning actor, playwright, and director. He was previously the artistic director of the Baltimore Center Stage and served on the boards of the major uh, London theaters, including the National Theater. Kwame. Hey, Susan. How are you? I'm okay. <laughs> and uh, it's it's beautiful to be here and beautiful to be invited and beautiful to be able to boast to my children that I'm on a platform that they have not been on before. Uh, <laughs> so, so overjoyed, overjoyed at being here and, 
and 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 I, it would be remiss of me not to say from the get-go, thank you for the work that you do for our sector. It's really, really important and it's really felt. Thank you. Next up, Lolita Chakrabarti. Uh, Lolita is an award-winning actor and writer. In theater, her recent adaptation of Invisible Cities brought together dance, music, and digital production. Um, and on screen, you may have seen her in Criminal, Born to Kill, and Beowulf. Uh, her stage adaptation of Life of Pi, check this out, guys, was scheduled to open on the West End last week. Lolita. <laughs> Hi, Susan. Thank you very much. And hello, everyone. Yes, I know I should be at the tail end of rehearsals opening a show. But anyway, more of that later, perhaps. But really thrilled to be here to join this discussion. Hi, everyone. Mm. And now to introduce last, but by no means least, my husband, Anthony, actually reminded me of this last night. The reason this is happening now is because of a conversation Lolita and Adrian and Anthony and I had around the, the kitchen table about this very subject, about how will we, and it was before COVID or any of this, how will we embrace uh, technology and figure out what the future of performance would look like? This was that that conversation, right, over over a roasted chicken dinner. Yeah. Um, let's move over to Adrian. Um, you know, uh, last but not least, he's a director. He's an Olivier award-winning actor whom you will no doubt recognize from his work across screen and stage, including Josie Rourke's Mary Queen of Scots and uh, Hustle and Nicholas Heitner's Othello. Welcome, Adrian. <laughs> Hello. Thank you, Susan. And thank, thank God for chicken dinners. Um, <laughs> I'm really pleased that we got to have that discussion and it led to this. This is fantastic. I'm, I'm really pleased to be here. Um, Kwame, like you said, I'm going to tell my kids that I've played to a bigger audience online than they've got, which is great. <laughs> um, and I wasn't even doing a TikTok. Uh, that's, that's amazing. <laughs> so um, it's a pleasure to be here. I look forward to a, a really interesting discussion that we're about to have. Great. So I want to urge everybody, you'll see under um, everyone's kind of pictures up here that there's a uh, donation uh, kind of links up there. Um, I want to urge you to think about looking at the Young Vic and RADA as places that you personally give. And I'll invite you later that in addition to reaching into your wallets to help out, not because of any other reason except for these arts institutions have to survive but also because you're from the tech community, we invite you to hear our stories, to hear what we're talking about. And if you have ideas for in-kind or how to partner with us, or if anyone has read Sam's article and can reach up to the Netflixes and Amazons of the world, because the creative power that comes out of the UK is something that needs to be nurtured and continue to be nurtured, not just saved. Um, I'm going to move on now. Let's get into the questions. Um, to all of you guys, you've told me that you do not think that live performance will ever be fully supplanted by virtual or digital experiences, but rather that technology can supplement and enhance live theater. What works and what have been your key learnings and takeaways? I, th I think the the first example of that actually is the um, the live streaming and digital theater that we've seen happening over the last, I don't know, 10 years, would you say Kwame, is it 10 years that's been happening? Um, it, it's been, I, I was in a America um, doing a job, an acting job, and I remember talking to a casting director who was really excited about the fact, and they were in, we were in New York, and they're really excited about the fact that they were about to go to a cinema and sit down at two o'clock in the afternoon so that they could watch a performance of a Shakespeare play taking place on the National Theatre stage at seven o'clock that evening. And during the conversation, the reason they were, they were excited about it was, yes, they get to see um, the perform. I think it was Helen Mirren, actually, and they get to see Helen Mirren on stage, and that's fantastic. But they kept stressing the live and connected nature of what was about to happen and how they were all excited about it. And they were going to go get some lunch and it's a half day in the office and then they're going to sit down and they're going to be at the National Theatre. But it was thousands of miles away and how weird is that? And um, the, the, the collective experience was the thing that everyone concentrated on in, in that aspect. I think what's really uh, exciting about live work is the unexpected. And so when you're having uh, virtual elements put in, they have to be pre-planned and worked out and orchestrated. 
But when you have people on a stage, anything can happen. Frequently mm. does, doesn't it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it can go totally wrong. Um, I've been in Shakespeare. I've, I've heard. I've yes, heard. So, so I've heard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember being in a Shakespeare play and thinking, oh, no, how can you ad lib Shakespeare? And the answer is, yes, you can. <laughs> In the moment. Well, yes, you have to. Yes, you have yes, to. I have, you have to. Exactly. In, in um, the pentameter, in the rhythm. It's great. Exactly. It's the challenge. But those are the joys. Those are the joys when, when, when what happens in the moment. And I don't think you can replicate that, but you can enhance and add to it with technology. Mm. I, I I think Susan, I, I think I may have slightly changed my my point of view from when I when we first spoke about this. I don't. I mean, again, I vacillate day by day depending on what the science or the tech says. Um, what I'm really interested in is period is augmentation, absolutely. But I think, for instance, in my theatre, I have three spaces, and I can well envision the time when what we're actually speaking about is the nature of life. And if something is being produced live in front of me, and it might be live holograms being controlled by human beings integrating with a story, um, I, I, I'm, it, that too would be something I'd be really interested in programming. I mean, I'm pulling holograms out of the air, of course, but I, I, I think it is what we will never lose is the element of life. That was, I was on the board at the time when NT Live was, was being launched. And I remember the fierce debates happening about, but, but is it live because it's on the camera? But actually, so long as we cemented the argument that actually it is being shot in real time, not being cut, that uh, everything that you say, Lolita, which is that actually someone can trip up, someone can dry as, you know, forget their lines, someone can, anything can happen, um, I, I think keeps it alive. What I think may never happen, and probably certainly within the next hundred years should not happen, is a, a kind of false binary of that thing that is tech and that thing that is human. And I think that, 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 that we should not remove the human being out of it because seeing the funk, seeing the spittle, feeling the heat coming off another human's body, seeing myself in 3D is the thing that makes me, on the whole, want to go into a live congregation. Mm. Yeah, I would agree. That yeah. moves me into the next question, which is, you know, an audience might believe that two actors on a stage, and, it, and this came with Lita, we were talking to you about this, that two actors on an empty stage are in fact in Paris or in medieval Scotland or on a ship in a storm. How does integrating technology uh, change what an audience is willing to believe um, and how can creators or developers navigate that? I don't think it changes it because I think you still can have two actors in a black box and say, I'm in Paris and we'll believe you. That's the beauty of theater is mm. that you don't have to show anything. You can just play it. Mm. Um, but in integrating technologies within that, you can enhance that experience and you could do anything. You could do crazy things with video technology, with props, with scenery, with sound, with music. Um, uh, there's so much with digital projection. You could, you could enhance that into something else. So I think it adds to what we have so far and it's the evolution of where we're going. Mm. May I? Mm. Yeah. Great. Um, you know, I, I think one of the beautiful things about theatre is that it is an abstract art form. Like if I'm on the telephone, I don't have to have the whole phone, right? I could just have the top bit or a wire or none, not at all. And the brilliant thing about film and television is that it is a literal art form. I, it says I'm in Paris and so I see the Eiffel Tower. There's always <laughs> going to be that show. It says I'm in London, I see the red bus go by. And I think where tech and live theatre can absolutely dance in, in, in an interesting way is, is by pushing abstraction to its maximum, not thinking that we have to be literal. Um, I was in Hong Kong a, a few years ago and there was a, a test that was being, I was so fascinated by this experiment where there were people live in the theatre we were in in Hong Kong and then there were um, actors in Norway and they were playing a scene together live. And what became really interesting about that is there's a, a, a trick in theater, which is called upstaging, which is if you want the attention to come to you, you just slightly move behind the actor that's, that's in front of you and the audience look at you. 
And so the problem with that experiment was that the people in Norway who were being projected onto the back street screen, that the, they were upstaging everyone because you only <laughs> looked upstage, right? As it was the, you only even looked at them at the back. But I was really fascinated. It was a wonderful latency problems um, happened a little bit, but that didn't matter. But there was a fascinating thing that we could be sharing the dialogue of, of truth, the experimentation of truth um, and liveness um, in, in, two, in countries across the world. And I think that technology, where technology will go next, who knows, that we might be able to solve the upstaging problem where <laughs> I can act, where I can actually stand and look at you and I, I don't think it's too hard and be playing face to face socially mm -hmm. distanced of course but mm -hmm. can be playing face to face can be playing in the way that we do live and I'm really excited to 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 hear and and to see the innovations in the tech space that that, that will say all right theater we know that, that that you exist for the visceral liveness and we can enhance that not make it separate. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm going to say very little because I agree completely with both of your your viewpoints. Um, the one thing that I wanted to bring up in terms of the technical aspect of um, how to enhance performance in the space, the augmentation, as you were talking about before, Kwame, um, the curious incident, the the curious incident, the dog in the nighttime, um, watching that show and watching what was done to the space and how stairs were created and escalators and the the marking out of the body and the, the way the floor changed and everything helps the audience get right inside the mind of that kid. Um, and it was all, all technical stuff. It didn't join people, join live people across a space. It was simply a very, very good use of how the incredible technical aspects, digital aspects were being used on a stage that completely wrapped themselves around a performance and augmented the production. And I think that's an area that's going we're gonna get better at that as well. Actually, Adrian, can I follow on from that a bit? Mm -hmm. and get your opinion. I mean, how do you think theater companies in the future will be able to use small screen experiences on on um, devices to connect with audiences? How do you how do you see that kind of evolving? I think I think the the the, the small screen, the, the tablets and phones and so on, um, they're just going to be a, a platform, a window with which to view these um, the, the performances take place. So um, again, we're gonna have to capture that live energy and transfer it to the smaller device. Um, there's a, there's a gr great use in terms of PR, which is a, a slight tangent because you can use PR for you know, films, movies, all sorts of things. But uh, there's an award-winning company and I don't I forget their name. You know, when you uh, scroll up in, in your timeline on, on maybe Twitter or Instagram or whatever, what, they, what they'd managed to do was they'd managed to replicate say three boxes, three entries on your timeline. The top box, they, they would advertise the cinema or the, the theater show or whatever. And then the people involved in that advert would jump out of that box and enter the box below and then enter the thread below that. So it looked as though the advert that you were watching had maybe it's a fight sequence and somebody dove out of the top box, caught the bottom box by the railing and then swung their feet into the bottom one and ran down a corridor. And they, they won awards for that. So that's one way of actually grabbing attention for mm. your um, for your product on the small on the small device but mm -hmm. uh, as far as um enhancement goes i think it's just another another window with which to watch what has already been created in, right. in susan, my... may, may I, susan may i say uh, absolutely adrian can i say that um there was a hit uh at the edinburgh film uh, not film edinburgh festival last year and i think it was called shopping malls of tehran or shopping malls in tehran and um what was brilliant about it is that when you walked in it they, they said okay so you can you can interact with this live or you can also switch on your instagram and your instagram will be running live throughout the show and that you got access to more information about what the character was saying or doing wow. when you was also following it on your phone. And, and at wow. first I thought that was really gimmicky and it was brilliant actually. Oh, was it? Okay. I, I, it, was, it was brilliant. It was, but, it was, it was it part of the performance. It was not distracting. It was part mm -hmm. of the performance. The right. narrator would say, now, if you click this picture, let me show you who X this lead character is, and let me show you their family. Why don't you take a second to do that? And then we'd take it, we'd look at it, and we'd scroll through it like if we're going through pictures on Instagram, and then we'd go, right, so now back to us. And then sometimes it was playing in the background, and other times it was leading. And I thought it was a really novel and interesting way by which to integrate the thing that never leaves our hands.
Our, <laughs> did it, did it, our, our it phones. Also, back call me to uh, Josie Rourke's uh, privacy at the Donmar that then went, went to New York, the same thing where we were encouraged uh, to use our phones. They were actually part of uh, the performance. But Kwame, you were an early advocate of finding ways to share theater uh, with those who could not be in the auditorium as the artistic director of Baltimore Center Stage Theater and on the board of the National. Um, why is this so important and how are you weaving technology into your future plans um, at the Young Vic? Um, I think a couple of things. Very early on, we, we were lucky. We were close to Johns Hopkins. Johns Hopkins, some, some uh, PhD students created a robot and that robot could come in to our auditorium and sit in a specific seat and look to the left and look to the right and move around. And the people at the other end were children in the hospital who couldn't physically come to the theater. And so, and it was something that was, I mean, it was so heartwarming. And also, um, you know, I, I think I, I found myself attracted to that because most of us who in theater, and I know this for my two friends here who are also on this Zoom with me, most of us did not come into theater to serve the 1% or the 4% or the 10% that may have walked through uh, the doors of a theater in the last year. We came in because we believe in access for all. Mm. And to ignore technology, to, to ignore its power to give accessibility to a space would be to be rather backwards thinking. So I've always found myself fascinating in, in, in the live, in how, that's, how it dances with technology, and then how we create um, digital byproducts that are uh, that dance alongside uh, mm. the main stage live theatrical event. Um, I, 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 I'm possibly it's because I want to show off to my children that I'm not like an old man that doesn't <laughs> understand technology. <laughs> that actually, that I'm right at the cutting edge. Look, look at what Daddy's done. Uh, I don't think it to me, Kwame. I don't <laughs> think it works because I still got to try and work. The television, yeah. but um, I am super psyched. I just heard from the control station from Matt and Co that we've been given ten minutes. So I'm not going to have to cut off the questions when I thought. I'm so psyched, Lolita. Can I come to you now? So you compared introducing technology into a play to putting a new character in the rehearsal room. What's the experience like for actors working with technology, and how do you see this developing I and mean, tell us about life of pi is there anything you can tell us in advance or what you did with um with the city's project um life of pi uh which we did at sheffield crucible and as you said was about to open in the west end now um was uh it was my script but it had a fantastic creative team of uh digital projection designer amazing director puppets that were beautifully designed and a, and a director specifically for the puppets sound mm. music um, and what was really interesting, because it's this iconic book about, for those of you who don't know, about a boy who um, uh, is on a shipwreck and gets stranded in the Pacific Ocean with a Bengal tiger on a lifeboat, um, and an orangutan, and a hyena, and a zebra. And um, apart from the logistics of it physically, it was how do you, in a, in a static theater, a thrust stage in Sheffield, make a shipwreck and the sea? Um, and what's fascinating is that it was a combination of all the different creative um, uh, ideas and uh, possibilities that made that possible. So out of the stage, uh, it, there was no, uh, there, there was, a, we installed a revolve, um, but other than that, there was no movement. So this, the ship would come up out of the stage and the digital projection and the movement of the actors and the puppets on that static boat um, made you feel like you were at sea. And the sound, which is often so um, forgotten or just peripheral, you're not aware that that's affecting your experience. Mm. I mean, literally, it went from side to side and you you, you felt quite ill because the mm. animals, I mean, I'm, I'm swaying as I'm doing it, the animals and pie would um, thrust from one side of the ship to the other. And that would have been impossible without all the technology, but also the conversation of all of us and me writing them into the script um, and, and the human dilemma at the heart of it. I always come back to the fact that the human dilemma at the heart of it is what allows all the different elements of creativity to really breathe. Mm. Um, one, sorry, yes. No, no problem. Were you, the next one, I just wanna send out to all of you. Um, and it's my last question because uh, I want to give it time. 
So thinking about the power of the arts during the current crises around health and social injustice, what lessons and inspiration can people take from art, whether as individuals or as leaders of countries, communities, or when we're talking to this tech audience, you've got a lot of VCs and founders and startups that we're talking to, people that have the choice to build the next um, you know, kind of fang business out there. What lessons and inspiration can people take from art? May I jump in? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, 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 please go ahead. Well, I was just going to pick up, thank you, um, on Susan's point at the beginning that Netflix has seen a huge um, take up in this time that we're all isolated and on our own. We need stories. We're missing stories. We're missing being together. We're all watching more as much as we can. We're reading, we're listening. Um, and I think that it's such a complicated and challenging, but potentially transformative time and art and stories is the way that we process what's going on and we make it all, uh, we examine it and we also um, explode what's been going on and move forward. Art is the way forward, I think. I, and I, 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 adding to that, I would say that any, any piece of art is, is really um, emotion put through the form of something. So the art of football, the art of piano playing, the art of, writing music, the art of dance, uh, the visual arts, the art of theater acting. It's always an emotion that's been put through a form. Once it's accessed that form, a person's response to it, art seeks to um, change the, the soul of people really. It, it bypasses all of the things that disconnect us. That's what art does. In order to reach you as a person, it cannot concentrate solely on one aspect of you. It has to reach inside and connect with all of the things that separate us as people. And I think even physically right now, we're being separated physically as people, but all of the other things in our society that, that creates a fissure be between our relationship between um, everyone around and who we are, art bypasses that, it, it goes through that and it reflects that back to us. It's quite a complicated answer, but I hope you know what I mean. Beautiful. I, I, I would say that I, I think it goes both ways, Susan. Um, Gil Scott Heron, of course, said the revolution would not be televised if it were not for tech. Um, many of us would not be out on the streets demonstrating. We would not have seen injustices mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. we actually cannot hide from or that we cannot deny. And so tech has, been, has done the thing, actually, that art strives to do. It gives us access. And so I think, I, I think that it, but it also goes the other way. The thing that art does is also, is that art, uh, you know, civilizations are judged by their art. If I say Egypt, we think about architecture. We think, if I say Greece, yeah. we think about yeah. its drama. If I say, you know, yeah. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there's a symbiotic relationship between the access that tech gives us and the comment on the human soul and spirit that art gives us. That if those two things dance together, the integrity of both of those fundamental things merge together. Mm. Um, our time in this moment in history will not be remembered for uh, the negative on the whole, but might be remembered for its its how deep it went into the into the human mind, the human soul, and the and reflected the human experience in an undeniable fashion. Hmm. So, everybody who's a guest here, how lucky are we? And I wish we were in front of a live a live audience because we could feel it back. How lucky are we to have? these three creatives in our universe, and isn't this, aren't we blessed? Um, thank you, Lolita. Thank you, Kwame. Thank, thank you. Adrian. Thank um, you. To the audience out there, we're gonna close with clips of the projects that both um, Adrian, or sorry, Lolita has worked on, and then also Kwame. And then for all of you who can join us in the Q&A, please do join us. So many more questions to be asked. Just so you know, click to the agenda, back in your um, main bit of the COGX homepage and then go down to the Q&A and click the little session box and push the play button. I know it sounds like, why is she telling me this? But I think it's helpful. Thank you all for joining. And can I invite you? You can come, you can click, you can link to us. If you have ideas of how to partner with these institutions, these artists, please bring it to us because we're open for this kind of collaboration. Thank you.
Imagine you arrive at uh, the theater. You put a virtual headset on and you find yourself standing in front of an animated house. And what unfolds, it's an immersive animated memoir. Draw Me Close is a performance that incorporates virtual reality to tell a story about a mother and her son over 25 years of their lives. And the piece itself is a very, very intimate encounter between an audience member and a performer. So you're in very close proximity, there's, there's contact, you're essentially having a conversation. As an actor, doing a one-to-one -one experience performance with an audience member is an incredibly special thing. It's a chance to really communicate a story and, and this beautiful writing. We'd been brewing the project for a while and it had had a couple of early outings working with Jordan and the National Film Board of Canada to cook it up and explore. Draw Me Close previewed at the Tribeca Film Festival in New York and then later at the Venice Film Festival where it had a really very exciting reception. Audiences were surprised by elements of, of the work. There is a very human story at the heart of the piece. People often locate themselves and their own mothers from the narrative. I was really excited about being able to bring this into a, a, a theatre rather than a film festival. What would an audience get? What would a theatrical audience get out of coming and experiencing Draw Me Close? It's a very gently guided piece, but it's really intense at the same time. Because I'm playing a mother, I am guiding you and I'm helping you through the whole experience. I've always conceived of the work as ultimately a theatrical work. This is the first time we've actually been able to really explore that to its full extent. That final incarnation is being brought to the stage at the Young Vic. It's been an intimate piece to make and also one to experience. It's an extraordinary international collaboration. It's a story which spans continents. Two very um, different men have a discussion about uh, life and death matters, but they have to do so without sharing a common verbal language. They use these kind of visions of cities, these conjurings of fantastical and real cities of the, of the world. The challenge to us is how to make those cities speak like characters. So my task was to tell some kind of theatrical, meaningful story that will move and fill these characters with motivation that satisfies those who are um, very attached to this book and Calvino's amazing words and those who don't know it at all. You know, it's not a standard theatrical setup. The audience uh, have a very different relationship to the performers and to the piece. The whole space comes to life, like we're trying to use the, the whole machinery of the production, the performers, the projection, the architecture and so on, is all a living character in the story. My gosh, what a fabulous session. Thanks so much to Susan Boster for moderating and all the panelists. I'm a, I'm a tech philosopher and it's amazing how when you break into another silo, you start to see the same questions appearing again and again. Uh, what is our relation to tech? Who are we as humans in an age of a machine where this technology is changing our relationship with other people? And I thought that what Kwame was talking about, about the abstract and the literal, we don't really know what's abstract and literal right now in an era that's driven by tech, because there are things that seemed absolutely impossible before that are possible now. So I have so many questions and do join them on uh, the Q&A, which is happening now. I'm sure that you have got so much to ask and so much to say. And please do continue this conversation because theatre and art is such a vital part of our culture, part of our politics, and ultimately a part of who discovering who we are. So thank you so much. Go and join the Q&A now.